The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to the online service here for Transfiguration Sunday. Let us stand and sing together the opening hymn, Beautiful Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. and the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the transfiguration of our Lord is from Exodus chapter 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin on his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin on his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he, what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin on Moses' face was shining. 
And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe, I believe in, in one God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker, maker of, of heaven and earth, earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. 
and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, Jesus on the Mountain Peak. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. What's it like climbing up a high mountain? Have you ever been? I had a small taste of it in Alaska years ago. At first, well, it's like any old hike. You're walking through the forest, perhaps with a slight rise to the terrain, the birds are singing and the leaves are rustling in the wind. You can even hear the sound of other people down below talking, working. But after a little while, those familiar sounds fade away. What's below disappears in the trees and you are just somewhere above, still protected by the forest. But eventually, as you continue to climb, even this protection falls away and you rise up out of the tree line and leave the familiar behind. The birds stop singing. The leaves are nowhere to be found. And you reach this moment, this certain height, where you begin to wonder, what am I doing up here? I've never been this high before. Should I even be up here? We get a real flavor of that from the disciples today, don't we? But not just from the physical mountain they are climbing. No, there's a reason Jesus led them up a high mountain to show them today's revelation. You don't just reveal something like this down on the plain. And why not? Why does this type of vision belong on a mountaintop? Because God created the visible world as an expression of all that is spiritual, like a big art project. What we see with our eyes is the visible version of his spiritual truth. But these two, the visible and invisible, heaven and earth, they're made to come together, aren't they? Yes, they're made to unite in the center of God's creation. That's right. Humanity, you and me, we are the center of his creation, made in his image, made according to the same pattern of the whole cosmos, 
but in seed size. We're microcosms of the whole. And that means that the places we see visibly, like mountains, are matched by invisible places within. When you're describing ascending a physical mountain, you're also describing something spiritual that takes place within your heart called trust, faith, worship. The disciples are going to reach that moment when they begin to wonder, what am I doing here? I've never been this high before. Should I even be up here? Should you? Should I? No, we certainly don't feel worthy. We may not feel like we belong. But there's a very specific person leading us. This is his idea. He calls you to join him. So what are you going to do? Can you trust him? Will you let him lead you up? And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Because heaven and earth had become one in this man and his flesh, and now he's revealing it to them. You ever wondered what it was like for those disciples? Realizing the sun is hiding inside your friend? No. Realizing your friend, this man, the one you know and love, is the source of all light. Yes. The divine logos in human flesh. He is the one who spoke to Moses on the Mount Sinai so that the skin of his face shone. He is the one Elijah spoke to on Mount Sinai, not in the strong wind, not in the earthquake, but in the low whisper. What are you doing here? That one. But here he is, now a man, pleased to reveal himself to his disciples in our human flesh. He wants them to see. He wants us to know. Not so we are terrified beyond belief, no. But so we know who it is that heads down that mountain, marching straight to the cross for us. Otherwise, we will lose hope. Otherwise, it will get too dark. Otherwise, we will run away and never come back. But not him. He won't run. This is why he's here. He's come to put that radiance back into all humanity. Now, the next thing we're told is that Peter actually opened his mouth in this situation. Why do we open our mouths when we should open our ears? Why do our hearts presume to move when they should remain still and receive? Honestly, what keeps you from being silent? What is it in your life that holds you back from being still, from trusting and receiving from God when he acts? Can you do it? Can you stop yourself and ask him calmly? Bend your heart low before him and presume to pray only when you've checked yourself. Not Peter, <laughs> at least not in this moment. Rabbi! It is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Three tents? What? So you can worship all three of them? We make up such funny ideas about God and worship, don't we? We idolize those things that point to God instead of God himself. We're constantly falling short of the top of the mountain even though it's intended for us. And so we must ask ourselves, what tents have I set up in the high places of my heart? How am I splitting my worship, my trust, my confidence, resting it in places that aren't the radiating one in the center? How have I let fear splinter my attention? Peter did not know what to say, and neither do we. 
But it's hard to admit we don't know, isn't it? We insist on our own made-up worldview. We resist changing it, even when we know there is something totally not stable about it. We fight. That is, until we find ourselves in utter darkness. God is even kind with his use of darkness. Did you see that? The cloud that overshadowed the disciples did more than stop Peter's mouth. It stopped him in his very center. The Lord brings his darkness to destroy our false world, to remind us he alone gives understanding and that we cannot make it up on our own. He created us to understand his way, his view, to understand him. And that's why he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Stop listening to yourselves. Listen to Jesus. Stop listening to your desires. Listen to Jesus. Stop looking around. Listen to Jesus. The moment the Father said this, it was Jesus only. Look. Are you looking? Listen to him. What do you think it was like coming down from there? Could life ever be the same? What do you do with an experience like that? Well, Peter learned something there that day. He took that listen to him to heart. For in his letter to the church later in his life, he said, Yeah, we saw the divine majesty on the mountain. We heard the voice from heaven. But there is something better than this vision. God's word, which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter got it. Listen to him. Listen to the word. It's better than any vision, and it's going into your ear right now. Will you have it? Will you let it shine there? Let it rise there for you too. For the Lord is seeding something. He is seeding that divine majesty into humanity in his death and resurrection. When you were united with him in the waters of baptism, he deposited that radiance into you. Yes, I know you don't see it. Not yet. Not like that day on the mountain. No, we wait for the resurrection as Jesus says. But Jesus has shown us now what will be in the end. A new humanity in which God dwells by his own word and spirit. Yeah, we're going to shine. This is what Christ has come to bring us. This is what the mountaintop moment shares. The Son of God doesn't simply save us from sin. He makes us into the glory of God through his very own flesh in which we are one. Take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. A husband shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Yes, marriage was always a revelation of how God unites to his people through his own flesh in Christ. And so you realize what this means. His sacraments, they're not just memorial rituals, but his way of staying physically united to his bride, the church. They keep her shining, though you see it not. They keep her radiant and pure, though faith alone perceives it. They keep her one with her husband, who is most certainly present with us in and through them. They are our mountaintop moment where heaven and earth are united into one as we wait for the resurrection and reunion with all who are trusting in him. Beloved, we are about to enter Lent. We're going down from the mountaintop moment onto that dusty road to the cross. This glimpse will be all we get until Easter dawns. And so our Lord prepares us to wait for our own resurrection, to see his radiant face, he teaches us 
to hold ourselves like Peter and James and John until that perfect moment when he finally share in this with new humanity with Christ in every way. For one thing is certain, the one who led us up this mountain also leads us to the cross and will lead us up out of the empty tomb on his holy last day. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Please rise for the prayer of the church. In our prayers this morning, we're going to remember the, pa- the family of Pastor Ward Yunker, Al Skilnick, Fran Moore, Mervyn Kaminsky, Gianni, Anna Marie, Christine, and our shut-ins, Elwood, Edgar, Joan, and Henry. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in your Son, your glory tabernacled in human flesh and blood to bring to us eternal life. Open the eyes of all people to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lover of the human race, Moses and Elijah appeared with the Savior in glory to witness that all the law and the prophets speak of him. Give all pastors and servants of the church such clarity in their teaching that all who listen to them may hear the voice of the Savior calling them to life. Bless Redeemer, with the pastor of your own choosing for this end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of the nations, you intend all authority upon the earth to be a blessing, not a burden. Remember those entrusted with civil authority here and in all places, and enable them to serve with wisdom and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforter of the sorrowing, You alone can bring peace that passes understanding to aching hearts. Remember all who are ill, hospitalized, lonely, afflicted, or dying, especially your servants, the family of Pastor Ward Junker, Al Skilnick, Fran, Mervyn, Gianni, Anna Marie, Christine, Elwood, Edgar, Joan, Henry, and those we name in our hearts. Let them sense your presence, taste your peace, and experience healing and relief according to your gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Immortal one, you raised your Son from the dead by your life-giving Spirit, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters who share in his endless life and glory. Receive our thanks for Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John, and all who have fallen asleep in our Savior's faith and friendship, bring us to behold with them the fullness of his glory in the age to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, and whatever else you would know that we need, grant to us, all glorious Trinity, for you are a good God, and you love your whole creation. To you we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever, Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. God's peace and blessings to you this Sunday. Boy, it is starting to feel like things are opening up. Stay tuned, take a good look there at uh, the emails you're getting from Chairman Jordan Wall. Uh, he's detailing out the way that things are reopening very carefully uh, with a lot of considerations and the details are there for you. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, follow through on those emails to register with him and find your place in the building. God bless you. Uh, one last thing perhaps for Lent, seeing as yes, there's going to be services being held at uh, Redeemer, which is great, but I'll still be here with you and join you online. One thing in particular uh, I'd like to, to let you know, there's going to be additional videos, three actually each week, a Monday, a Wednesday, and a Friday, and each of these Two of the, well, the Monday and the Friday are going to be a little shorter, three to four minutes max. But the, the midweek Wednesday will be a full Vespers service, maybe about 30, 35 minutes with, with, a, with a sermon uh, of regular length. And these will each take us with Christ uh, toward the Holy Week and his cross. The Monday will feature a poem from one of our own pastors, a poem of the Passion. The Wednesday will actually walk with our Lord in his last 24 hours, looking in detail at some of those things that happened to him, which we don't ever get enough 
uh, meaty look and preaching on. And then the Friday will be good news in a bad news world, the Psalms of Lent, those meditations from the saints of old entering into those together as we head towards the fulfillment of all things on the cross with Christ. God bless you. Make use of all those. And we'll see you next week.